Okay, so we are in a series that we kicked off last week called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Who in here wants to make better decisions this year? Come on. I never met one person. I said, man, I want more regrets. Just bring them on. How many regrets can I get in one day? <laughs> I haven't met that person, okay? Um, but here's a, a disturbing thought to kick off today's message, okay? The easiest person to deceive is the person you look at in the mirror. The easiest person to deceive is the person that you look at in the mirror. Just think about it for a second. Who in here, maybe you've talked yourself into something, you deceived yourself into something, maybe you have sold yourself on something. Truthfully, we are the mastermind behind most of our regrettable decisions, most of the regrettable things that happen whether they were financial, relational, professional, academic, um, you, are, you are there for all of them, for all of them. Just to make it worse, since I'm being so encouraging today so far, just to make it worse, you've probably done more to undermine your own success and your own progress than any other individual on the planet. Maybe. Maybe. Now, here you go. We know there's outside pressures. There's other voices that try to speak into things that we're doing. There's people promising you stuff. There's Facebook that tracks the things that you view and then throws those ads conveniently on your news feed to, to get you to, to buy something. But in the end, what's the truth? You decide it. We decide it. And the reason why I can say that is because I'm equally as guilty. I, have, I am responsible for some of the worst decisions I've made in my life, in my life. There, it's kind of like this. This is the way I like to put it. It's kind of like there's a sales associate that lives in my head. It kind of feels that way, like there's a, like a sleazy used car sales associate that lives in my head. And, and his voice, and the problem is his voice kind of sounds like my voice. And although his logic is completely flawed and his, and his sales pitches are amateur at best, I catch myself falling for them all the time. For all, I fall for them all the time. Now, what's up with that? What's wrong with me and what's wrong with you? What's wrong with us that we fall for the sales associate in our heart, in our head? And that's the point of today's message. That's the point of today's message. Like I said, we're in this series called Better Decisions and Fewer Regrets. And kind of the big idea of this series is the, the often overlooked relationship between good questions and good decisions. The often overlooked relationship between good questions and good decisions. And I believe as we try to walk in obedience towards Jesus this year, we have to be willing to slow down long enough to ask good questions. To ask good questions. I'm convinced that if you will ask, answer honestly, and then act on those answers, you will find yourself walking in obedience better this year to Jesus than any other year in your life. If you're willing to do those things and have fewer regrets. Okay. Now I want to highlight this Bible verse. Um, I got to ask for forgiveness because we have an incredible production team and I just totally forgot to send them my, my Bible notes this week. So we don't have any pop-ups on the screen today. I'm sorry. I made a decision that I regret. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but uh, but I, want, I have a Bible verse that I wanted to highlight that I actually encourage you to make it a memory verse there in the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Check this out. Proverbs 27, 12 says this. The prudent, I like that word, the prudent. <laughs> the prudent see danger and what? Take refuge. But the simple keep going and pay the penalty. That's a good Bible verse. That's a good verse. Now, I'm not calling anyone simple in here today, and I don't think the Bible is. But in fact, oftentimes, we see danger, and we don't do anything about it. And we just keep going. We keep going about our day. Keep going about like nothing's going to happen. See, or because, or because we haven't got help, what often happens, we can make decisions today based on yesterday's traumas. We can make decisions today based on yesterday's traumas. And here what we're going to do with the five questions we're going to ask there in this series. We're going to start a conflict with that sales associate in our head. We're going to, st we're going to Mike Tyson that sales associate, but not bite his ear off. But maybe. 
but maybe. Um, uh, we're going to start a conflict with the sales associate that lives in your head. And check this out. The Apostle Paul r- writes about this sales associate that lives in, uh, lives in our head. Romans um, 7 says this. He says, Paul says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Who can relate to Paul? The thing I said I don't want to do, I keep doing it. And the thing I said I'm going to do, I don't start doing it. And I keep fighting myself eating that McRib again. See, the cells associate that lives in your head, well, it's not new. And that cells associate, it's, it's not just you. There's a conflict. There's a conflict. And we have to overcome it. It doesn't help that we live in a world that glorifies hurry, that survives on instant, and focus you to focus on the immediate rather than the ultimate. But here we go. Let's jump right into these questions I keep talking about, and we're going to go with one question today. And you got to come back next week to hear the other ones, okay? Here you go. Question number one is what I call the integrity question. The integrity question. Now, like I said in the beginning, the easiest person to deceive is the person you look at in the mirror. That's the easiest person to deceive, which means the hardest person to lead is yourself. The hardest person to lead is yourself. We are the hardest person to lead. And here you go. You cannot lead yourself if you're constantly deceiving yourself. You can't lead yourself if you're deceiving yourself at the same time. Have you ever tried to lead a liar? Have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone who just lies all the time? It gets pretty frustrating, doesn't it? I, I had this friend um, in Virginia Beach who used to, he, he would lie about everything. He would eat waffles in the morning, but tell everyone he ate pancakes. Like, you didn't have to lie about that, man. Like, no one cares if you're eating pancakes or waffles. See, in the marketplace, in the professional world, um, what do you do if someone is, has a constant, is a constant liar? Well, you fire. You fire a liar. And so here you go, through the help of the Holy Spirit in you, I'm going to challenge you to fire the dishonest version of you and hire a new honest you, a new honest you that tells you the truth, check this out, that tells you the truth even if it makes you feel bad about you. I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a second. But here you go, the reason why I say this is is because dishonesty erodes credibility, even to ourselves, even to ourselves. Dishonesty erodes credibility even to ourselves. Now, that may sound kind of odd, but when you lie to yourself long enough, you start believing yourself. You start believing yourself, and it erodes your own credibility. When you lie out loud, here you go. Maybe I'm the only one that has done this before, and if I am, you guys can all pray for me at the end of the service, okay? Um, but, but when you lie out loud, and I'm not calling anyone here a liar, I know we all kind of stretch the truth sometimes, but when you lie out loud, what do you do immediately on the inside, in your heart, in your head? We justify the lie. We justify the lie. But here you go. Who do we justify the lie to? Ourselves. (laughs) We justify the lies to ourselves. And here's the crazy thing. And again, maybe this is just me. Maybe it's not you. It's probably not you. It's probably just me. But but what happens is is then we create a narrative that justifies the lie or the half-truth or the untruth that we told. And the crazy part is we believe the narrative that we just made up. Like it actually really happened. Again, that's not you. But it's me. So be thinking about that as you listen to me talk. I mean, mean, why would you believe a narrative you basically just made up? Well, the non-technical term of this, the non-clinical term that I came up with this is you and me. Well, you are a sucker for you. You're a sucker for yourself. We love ourselves. We want, we, we're trying to do this. And you can convince yourself of just about anything, and so can I. And this is how I feel, honestly, Every single time I go to Target with my wife. Every single time. My wife is so good at convincing herself that she needs things from Target that she convinces me. We'll be walking through Target, going there to pick up like some soap or something. And the next thing I know, Aaron's like, oh, this is a good dog bed. I think we need this dog bed. And I'm like, you're right. We do need a dog bed. But we don't even have a dog. She is good at it. 
<laughs> I'm joking, kind of, but not really. <laughs> but, but like they teach in, in, re- in recovery programs and stuff that I learned from my own personal recoveries in my life. Rigorous honesty is the first rule of recovery. Rigorous honesty is the first rule of recovery. See, we must be honest with ourselves and others. That's the first step of getting better and making progress to make better decisions and to avoid unnecessary regret. You got to tell yourself the truth. And Jack Nicholson may say, you can't handle the truth. Wrong, Jack. No one seen that movie? I was about to say, I'm not the only one. What about Will Smith in that one movie? He said, tell me the truth. No? Okay. Whoa. Maybe I watch too much movies. Okay. Um, You have to tell yourself the truth even if it makes you feel bad about yourself. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Should we be making ourselves feel bad about ourselves? No. No, you shouldn't make yourself feel bad about yourself. But check this out. What I'm going to say next is actually kind of opposite of what the culture teaches us. And here's the, and here's the truth, guys. Can I be honest with you guys today? We're family, I think. Can I be honest? I've been pastoring for like over 10 years now. And, and the, more, the longer I pastor, the less I care about being liked and the more I care about you finding freedom. It, it, that's, what I honest, that's what I honestly care about. So here's the truth. There are worse things than feeling bad about yourself. There are worse things than feeling bad about yourself. For starters, denying something bad about yourself. Denying that there's something bad about yourself. Refusing to acknowledge what's bad about ourselves is bad for ourselves. It's bad for ourselves. For example, for years, um, I used to get angry so fast. Like, like, if anyone knows me now, if anyone knows me since I've moved to Richmond, you'd be like, Jacob, you used to get angry fast? You're just so kind and gentle like a little sheep. I hope you don't call me a sheep. Bye. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, but if you knew me a long time ago, I used to get angry so fast. That was, that was the problem that I have. And, and, and for years, and for years, I, I, I would, my temper would get the best of me, which would cause me to say things and do things and act ways that I would later regret and what? Have to do the work to apologize to people and make things right. And it would happen all the time. But here's even the crazier part. People, people used to even praise my anger at times. People used to praise my anger and not call me angry. They would come up with, a, with another creative word to describe my anger. They would say, well, Jacob, you're just passionate. And that's true. I am a passionate person. I get passionate about a lot of, a lot of things. But I knew in me, I had to be honest with myself. I had to tell myself the truth. What's the difference of the passion I feel about something? And when does that anger from insecurity, that anger from that fear of not being heard, that anger come, when does that anger come up? And how can I acknowledge it? And so I did. I worked on it. It's hard. It's hard. I used to be a hot-headed person. Now I like to think of myself as a cool breeze. Maybe not, though. I don't know. Um, but, but here you go. I could have just let people praise it and be, oh, yeah, I'm a passionate guy. No, or I can acknowledge. I could be honest with myself. I could tell the truth about myself, even if it didn't feel, make me feel good about myself. So, the, so to make the best decision, you have to be honest with yourself, even if it makes you feel bad about yourself. All right, let me put it another way. Here's another way you can put it. You will never get where you need to be until you acknowledge where you actually are. Let me say that one more time. You'll never get where you need to be until you acknowledge where you actually are. Not where, you're, not where the sales associate tries to convince you where you are, but where you actually are. When you're actually getting honest with yourself. See, the truth is this. If you aren't honest with yourselves about the choices you are choosing, you have a difficult time taking responsibility for the results that you're getting. Oh, come on. I'm preaching good right now. This is some good preaching. See, see we, have, we have a word for people who refuse to take responsibility for the outcome of their decisions. We call them irresponsible. Don't we? Do, and do you want to be irresponsible? I don't think you do. If we're dishonest with ourselves and when we're making a decision, we will be dishonest with ourselves where to lay the blame for the outcome of bad decisions. Dishonesty leads to irresponsibility. Now, I don't believe anyone in their hearts want to be dishonest. I don't believe you want to be dishonest. I don't believe you want to go another day of your life lying to yourself. So question one, the integrity question. Here it goes. I'd set all that to set up this very simple question that you, can, you need to ask yourself 
when making decisions. Here it goes. Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself? Now, you don't owe it to anyone else, but you owe it to yourself to be honest with yourself about the decisions that you are making, about the choices you are making. There's no win in justifying your decisions besides... You guys ready for my corny one today? I get one corny joke a day. Okay, you ready for this one? Besides, justifying, you want to know what justifying is? It's really just a lion. Just a, just a lion. Why would we lie to ourselves? Why would we do it? Just tell yourself the truth. Now, it helps for me to ask this question out loud. It helps for me to ask this integrity question out loud. And when I ask the integrity question, what also helps to ask, when you ask yourself this integrity question, is to add an additional word to this question. You ready for this? Am I being honest with myself? Really? Am I being honest with myself? Really? And the reason why we add the really is because we are so prone to deceive ourselves. Why am I doing this really? Why am I avoiding him really? Why do I keep postponing that really? Why do I keep making excuses really? Why did I say yes really? Why did I choose to wear this really? Why did I choose to purchase or lease that really? Why did I move in really? Why did I move out really? Why won't I get help like, like, like really? Like why won't I really get help? Because I know the things I keep doing are the things I don't want to do, and the things that I want to do I don't keep doing. What's wrong with me? Why do I do this really? What's really going on on the inside, on the inside? And here you go. Here's one thing I've learned in my time of following Jesus. Jesus isn't interested in, like, behavior modification. He's not interested in behavior modification. What do I mean by that? He's not interested in, oh, well, you just got to work harder, do better, and once you do that, then you're good. Because Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what Jesus is saying is, until we begin to work on our hearts, our actions will never follow suit. Oh, come on, man. So sometimes we focus so much on our behavior and we live in a world that's all about your behavior that Jesus actually wants to confront the conditions of our hearts so that when he confronts our hearts, we move from a place of his grace and our actions then follow the goodness of his love. Oh, come on. See, here's the thing. You may not be good at selling yourself or selling anyone else, but when it, but when it comes to selling yourself on a bad idea— you're amazing at it. And so am I. So am I. Our greatest regrets are associated with things and opportunities and people we sold ourselves on. Just think about your last bad relationship. I don't want to think about my last bad one. It's been some years now, but, but it was bad. I had a couple of strikeouts before I met my amazing, wonderful, beautiful wife, Erin. But, but here you go. Think about your last bad relationship. You are in love or you were in lust, you were in something. You were in something. But because you were in something, mama tried to warn you. Best friends trying to warn you. Her social media account should have concerned you. But you what? You knew just exactly what you were doing until you didn't. Until you didn't. And then you're looking back and you wonder, what was I doing? What was I thinking? Which is the problem. You weren't thinking. You were selling. You were selling yourself on the decision. The same is true for any recent bad purchase that you made. Any recent bad purchase decisions you made. Once you had it in your hand or once you saw that number light up on your online cart, beep. Oh, beep, beep. Oh, and so, like, oh, I need this. What do you do? Something took over. And the next thing you know, you start handing your credit card to someone. Or they make it so easy on your phone now, you can just smile, smile, and your credit card goes automatically on it. And, and then you what? You buy something you, you didn't need or, or, you, or you couldn't afford. And why? Because you sold yourself on it. You sold yourself on it. Here's a tip. I got a tip for us today. And I'm preaching to myself today too, okay, guys? Here, here's a tip. As soon as you start selling yourself on something, you should hit pause. 
As soon as you start selling yourself on something, you should hit pause. And here's the reason why. Because we rarely have to sell ourselves on a good idea. We rarely have to sell ourselves on a good idea. I remember when I got ready to, ready to uh, propose to Aaron. I didn't have to sell myself on getting married to Aaron. I thought to myself, dang, I'm a lucky guy. I'm a lucky guy. Our, our, our connection was beautiful. We had similar life goals. Our values matched up um, perfectly. It was a good idea. See, when it comes to good ideas or good decisions, we usually just know. Like we know, if we're being honest today, we know we should spend less time on our phones and more time with our loved ones. Like, like, like we know we should probably read more than just one book a year, and the Twilight books don't count. Like we know, and this is a, this is a hard truth for us to, to take in, that McRib I keep talking about, it ain't good for you, okay? So we, we just need to tell ourselves the unfiltered truth. Be honest with ourselves. And it may hurt, hurt you for a moment, but in the end, it will work out for the better. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like what we bring to the light, God can begin to do something with it. This is another way to think about it. If you are doing something, and if it was exposed to the light, the thing that you're doing, and not saying you're doing anything, but, but, but if you were doing something and, and if it was exposed to the light and you would be afraid that anyone would see the thing that you're doing exposed to the light, you probably already have the answer to the question of should you be doing this thing? Am I being honest with myself? Really? Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, though. His grace, his goodness, it covers, it covers us even the things that have been done in the dark. Even the things that no one knows about. John 8, 12 it puts it like this. Jesus says this. Then he said, I am the light to the world, and those who embrace me will experience life-giving light, and they will what? Never walk in darkness. Now, that's not Jesus saying you're never going to have a bad thing happen to you. He's not saying that. See, don't get confused. Don't confuse the gospel thinking if you're going to follow Jesus and your life becomes like, like unicorns and pretty, pretty pony pictures everywhere. No, no. When you follow Jesus, life is still hard because life is hard. Things happen in this world that we cannot, we do not, and we cannot control. And things come at us from all different directions. Life is hard. Depression Depression is real. Anxiety, oh man, I feel anxious a lot. See, Paul, when he said the things I don't want to do, I keep doing, he's saying there's a conflict that we have. But Jesus is saying in this verse, when you come to me, when you follow me, I am the light of the world. And when you're in darkness, I walk with you. You don't have to do it by yourself. See, so, so what do I say to that? I say, bring, bring your decisions Bring your fears, bring your worries, bring them to the light of Jesus and watch him cover you with his amazing grace. Watch him. Watch him not condemn you because he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world, to save you and me. <sighs> My iPad jumped pages on me. Technology so good. Here you go. So now this seems like this should be the end of my message, right? Tell yourself the truth. Stop lying. Bring it, bring it to the light. That, that would be good if I could stop there. But like most of us know, you know and I know, choosing what's best isn't always what's natural. Choosing what's best for us isn't always what's natural for us. If you're someone who would consider herself a naturalist or a materialist, you know, they have an explanation for, for why it's difficult to tell ourselves the truth. Jesus followers, as Jesus followers, we have a different explanation, something that we would call the sinful nature and why we have a hard time at, at, at doing what's best for us. But everyone pretty much agrees that when we come into the world, we have a natural propensity on selling ourselves on what we, on what we want to do rather than what we should do. We have a good, we do a good job at selling ourselves what we want to do instead of what we should do. And here you go. There's this uh, 17th century English philosopher named Francis Bacon. It's a good name to have. Uh, that, that says something that I thought was pretty interesting. It says this. He says this. 
the human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, so, so once you come up with an idea, once you think of something that's going to work for you, it, it says this, draws all things else to support and agree with it. Talk about our culture today. You're either for me, you're against me, you, you think differently, you vote differently, then we're not, we're not, we can't talk. Isn't that how our world operates a lot today? See, and then he continues. He says, And though there be a greater number of weight of instances to be found on the other side, yet these are either neglected or despised, or else by some distinction set aside and rejected. What he's saying, basically, he's, uh, is a fancy 17th century way of, of calling what we would describe confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. That we are naturally open or we naturally open up ourselves to anything that confirms what we actually already want to do. And we all are guilty of that. We instinctively set aside or reject anything on the contrary. Now, I wonder what Jesus would have to say to us about confirmation bias. I wonder what Jesus would have to say to us. Now, we have this very interesting story in the Gospels about Jesus dealing with the sales associate, and that's me using some creative freedom here, but, but, but it wasn't himself, but it was him being tempted. Now, and I think, he, I think this story helps us answer this integrity question, okay? So let me sum it up real fast. Matthew 3, we see Jesus, he's baptized, and it's this big scene. It's a perfect picture of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and we hear, the, we hear the, voice, the voice of the Father said, this is my Son whom I love, with him I am well please. Then Matthew's gospel says something that's so interesting to me. It's always been interesting to me. And I think the more I follow Jesus, is I understand this is more the way that, that God works. Jesus has this incredible moment of celebration. God, God confirms who he is. This is my son. Then the text says the same spirit that, that, that ascended on him, that, that, that descended on him, it says that same spirit led him to the wilderness to be tested. And, and I hear that story sometimes. And I think to myself, that is just so, isn't that just so weird? Like I'm worshiping Jesus in church and then I go outside of church and then bad things happen to me. I'm praising Jesus on Sunday and then Monday comes, I don't even like my job. And I'm definitely going to uppercut that coworker if he says something again. Isn't it interesting that the Spirit will meet us and prepare us to go out? The Spirit meets us and prepares us to go out. Check this out. The story, I love the story. So, so then Matthew tells us that the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and, and, and was tested by the tempter. He didn't do it 21 days of prayer and fasting. He did a whole 40. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good on you, Jesus. I'm going to do 21. Okay. Now, I believe this story gives us two insights on how to refuse the cells associate in our head and follow Jesus. Matthew 4 says this, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Who said the Bible would be lying? If you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, you'd be hungry too. All right. Here you go. Um, insight number one. We are in a spiritual fight. We are in a spiritual battle. Now, let me make this make sense. See, in our Western culture, in our information age, it's very easy to just make everything just physical or just logical. Or just, oh, this is, this, this is that and this is this. In doing so, we can eliminate the spiritual fight that is happening. Now, may I throw out here today? Can I just throw something out for you to think about? You don't got to believe what I'm about to say, but can you just think about this? That thought that you keep getting, the thing that you keep, that you keep, wanting to do, that you promise yourself that you're not going to do to anymore. You promise yourself and other people that you won't, you won't do anymore. The reason why that thing keeps coming back to you, maybe it's not just because you're a messed up person. Maybe it's because there's a spiritual attack that does not want you to, to succeed. There's a spiritual fight that does not want you to succeed that's coming against you. Now, I am not saying the phrase, the devil made me do it, is valid, because it's not. But I have read this story about Jesus in the wilderness hundreds of times. I preached about it dozens of times, and I always just read it from this physical standpoint. I always read it from the standpoint that, man, 
He, had, he didn't eat anything. He didn't, have, he didn't have anything to eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And man, didn't Satan, didn't the devil pick his right time to get him, to test him, to tempt him right at the end of not eating for 40 days? Because man, he caught Jesus when Jesus was hangry and he was probably at his lowest. And so, and so that's, what, that's what happens, right? The enemy comes when we're at our lowest and tries to pick at us. I got a new perspective to this story. I got a new perspective to the story. Now, physically, Jesus was tired. Jesus was worn out. Jesus was hungry. But spiritually, come on, spiritually, Jesus was more prepared to take on the challenge from the enemy than any time in his life. Because for 40 days, he spent time with God. For 40 days, he was preparing his heart for what was to come. And I think so often we read the story and we think about the physical poor Jesus. He was so hungry. But the truth is, good for Jesus, he prepared himself for the battle that was to come. See, friends, the problem is we face many things. We face many spiritual issues that we try to resolve with physical answers, which is, which is a logical choice. Now, here you go. Here you go. <clears throat> My second insight is this. Have grit. Come on. Have grit about who you are in God. I love that word grit. Not to be confused with grits. And you can put sugar on grits. I don't care what you say. It's good. But, 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 but Jesus, he was physically tired. He was physically tired. And you, oh, come on, come on. You may be physically tired. You may be worn out. You may be going through something that you don't want to go through anymore. You may be tired of that person that keeps, that keeps, you keep leaning out a hand to them and they keep stabbing you in the back. You may be going through something. You may be having issues that you can't believe. You may be tired. You may be worn out, stressed out, unsure about the decisions you have made. But, but as we follow Jesus, we see that he had grit that of who he was in God. And, and, and the reason why I say grit, he had resolve. He had strength of character. He had courage. And so when the tempter came, when the temptation came, each temptation was strategically attacking Jesus' identity in God. And when that temptation came, Jesus said, I know I'm a child of the Most High God. I know who God called me to be. I know my purpose. And friends, I got some more bad news for you. Bad days are still to come. Bad reports are still going to happen. Things are going to happen in your life that you wish won't happen. But you can be gritty in God. You can have courage to stand up and not give up. You can have courage to say, depression, you won't get the best of me. Fear, you're not going to hold me down. I'm a child of the Most High God, and I'm going to keep going in the direction he has for me. I'm going to be honest with myself. See, now the root, here you go. And James, you can come on up and play something on the, on the piano for us. At the root of the tempter's attack, he attacked the heart. At the root of the tempter's attack, he attacked the heart. He said to him three times, if you are the son of God. Matthew 3 told us that the voice of heaven came down and said, you are my son whom I love with you. I'm well pleased. Next verse, next story, the tempter says, if you are the son of God. If you are who God really said you are. He attacked his identity. He attacked his heart. And at the root of our decisions, it's your heart. It's your heart. At the root of the integrity question, it's about your heart. And the reason why, the reason why we sell ourselves or justify or even compare ourselves to what we see on social media or people around us, the reason why it's because it's easy to lie to ourselves. It's easy to lie to ourselves. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah put it like this in Jeremiah 17, 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Dang, I don't like that. I don't like that verse. Your heart, my heart, her heart, his heart. The hearts of those little precious kids of yours. Text tells us the heart is deceitful above all of those. 
And I think Jeremiah chooses his adjective carefully because there's a difference between being dishonest and deceitful. Dishonest, well, dishonest is a lot easier to spot. You can, dishon- you can spot a dishonest person pretty, pretty easy. But deceitful is difficult to detect. A deceitful person can be difficult to detect. See, most of us can detect a dishonest person but difficult people. But, but deceitful people, those are the dangerous ones. And text says our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts are dangerous. And it's why we're so convinced that time and we're so good at convincing ourselves at times. We, we don't merely lie to ourselves. We deceive ourselves. And this is how it works, I think, anyways. Once you get your heart wrapped around something that, that you want, I think our heart sends a message to our brain and says, Hey, brain, I want this. Figure out a way to justify it. And our brains are really smart, so that's why we call them brains. Our brains know how to know how it's difficult to justify a want. And, but, but so what do our brains do? They change a want to a need. They change that want to a need. So first the brain does, he upgrades the message to something far more sophisticated than a want. The brain says, you need this. And have you, and if, it, if you ever struggled with addiction, if you ever struggled with just a bad relationship, you find yourself thinking, I just don't want this. I need this. I got to have this. There's that urge that feels like you can't live without it. And before long, we have a list of justifications for buying it, drinking it, asking it out, inviting it in. And the reason we use, and the reason why is because we sell ourselves for something. Come on, let's be honest. We sell ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things. And then he says this, and then it, the verse don't get better. It doesn't get better. He says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. There's no cure. It's a, per, it's a permanent condition. And here you go. And this is where, James, this is for me, this is where like the Pentecostal in me wants to come out. I want to be like, but in Jesus' name, that's that heart of yours. He can take it and change it. And he died on the cross. And three days later, he rose again. And since he rose, he, gave him the grace. he can heal that heart of yours in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. That's what I want to do. But if I'm being honest today, can I just be honest at church today? I know Jesus saved me. I know he's healed me and freed me of things, but I still find myself wanting to do the things I do not want to do. I still find myself doing the things that I told myself I would never do that again, and the things I want to do, I don't do. And why is that? Because maybe this heart condition, maybe it's a permanent thing. But friends, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. The, be, the moment you begin to understand something is the moment you can begin to set up the proper things you need to overcome something. Come on, come on. See, the problem is if you want to stay in dishonesty, if you want to lie to yourself and keep believing, oh, I just went out with that person because I was lonely. Oh, I just did this because I had that. Oh, I just had this addiction because, oh, it just runs in my family and that just is what it is. I'm telling you, we can be dishonest with ourselves all day long, but when you you get honest with yourself. That's where real grit comes in. That's where real courage comes in. And you say to yourself, I've been watching this, this Cookie Monster show with my daughter, my three-year-old, and Cookie Monster is always saying, and I say to me self, we got to start being like Cookie Monster. We got to say to me self, I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to think this way or act this way. I don't want to believe this way anymore. I got to acknowledge that my heart can be deceitful and beyond cure. I can't outmature. I can't outgrow. I can't outspend it. I can't outstatus it. But what I can do, come on. But what I can do, I can get to the feet of Jesus and say, to him as I bring my stuff to the light? Am I being honest with myself really? Am I really being honest with myself? And look at the mirror and say to yourself, I'm going to start today. I'm going to start today. Because we know, because you know, 
that the regrets in your life, they do affect you. But they also affect the people who look up to you and the people around you. And like Jesus, the text says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. Meaning, Jesus thought about people. He thought about those who he would bring in right standing before God to endure the cross. Friends, let's be honest with ourselves. Really. Pray with me. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your goodness. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. With everything, for everything, thank you, Jesus. With everything, for everything. I just feel like the Holy Spirit very clearly Speaking to some people that you've had just so much disappointment. I mean, like, just gut punches of disappointment. And I feel the Holy Spirit speaking one very gently to that disappointment. And I feel the Holy Spirit saying, He is sorry for that. Mm, I even feel it, a father wound, very strongly. Yep, your father earthly father has disappointed you. Mm. And I feel the Holy Spirit very clear saying he is sorry that you've had to experience that. That was not what he had planned for you. And now that you feel the Holy Spirit reminding me of a verse that says if a good father knows how to give good gifts to his parents, good, good gifts to his child, What more does the Heavenly Father know how to give to His children? That's why the Holy Spirit is speaking to, either that's one or two or three. I don't know who who I'm speaking for. Maybe you're even online. I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone. You've had disappointment after disappointment with your earthly father. And He is saying He's sorry for it. And as as your Heavenly Father, He wants to pour out His grace and His goodness on you. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Be in this place. Mm. That's like the Lord is telling some people to have grit to own up to your mistakes. Be gritty. It's okay. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. So, God, we love you. We need you. And God, even with this 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're about to to journey on as a church, I pray, Holy Spirit, you meet people. You meet people that say, hey, I'm going to give up social media. You meet people that say, hey, I'm going to read my Bible once a day. You meet people, whatever they do, whatever they offer to you, Lord, meet them in miraculous ways. May it be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. So God, we love you, we need you, in Jesus' name, amen.